Today we're going to talk about molecular electronic spectroscopy. We've done sort of an introduction to molecular spectroscopy on previous videos, so make sure you're going back and watching that. But today we're going to talk about molecular spectroscopy, building towards Jablonski diagrams and photochemistry. So, let's start maybe with this discussion of electronic spectroscopy. Remembering what we learned from the introduction, from previous lecture, as well as a couple lectures ago when we did atomic spectroscopy. In atomic spectroscopy, we had these levels where one was a ground state. And there's an excited state. And maybe in this example, there's going to be two excited states. And now it's not just an atom anymore, it's a molecule. And we'll learn a lot about today what that means. But for now, it's much like our atomic spectroscopy diagram. This is all on an energy scale. Ground state is the lowest in energy and some couple of excited states. And the excited states here are different organizations of the electron. And let's think about a particular molecule. Uh, let's think about chlorophyll. The chlorophyll, chlorophyll molecule has a electronic structure like this, where the ground state is separated from the first excited state by about 1.91 eV. And this is equivalent to 650 nanometers. Now, that's one possible transition that chlorophyll can undergo, rearranging its electrons to put them in perhaps different molecular orbitals corresponding to this excited state one. But there's another excited state up here that corresponds to some other arrangement. And maybe that other arrangement is 2.75 eV above the ground state, which corresponds to about 450 nanometers. Remembering our equation, E equals hc over lambda, c the speed of light, h Planck's constant, lambda r wavelength. So this is the simplified picture of a chlorophyll electronic structure, chlorophyll molecules electronic structure. So when light strikes a plant, and that plant has chlorophyll in it, Right? And maybe this is the leaf of said plant. And there's some vein running down the center of it. And inside here, there's a chlorophyll molecule. And as light comes in, well, light is a bunch of different wavelengths. I should draw it as white, but we're on a white background, so that complicates the things. So let's think about it as black, but let's assume it's white light made up of all the wavelengths. Now, for chlorophyll with this ground electronic state, it's only going to absorb red and blue light. Okay, so while there's, maybe this is the better way to draw it, while there's red light and blue light and green light striking this chlorophyll molecule, only the red light and the blue light is absorbed, so the green light is what is reflected. And so the green light is the light that, of course, comes up and strikes our eye, and so we see the chlorophyll molecule, or the plant as a whole, as green. Why? Because of this electronic structure of the chlorophyll molecule. Right? Because these quantized states are organized like they're organized, they absorb red and blue light, and the complementary color here that is reflected and not absorbed is green, so plants appear green to us. But this is a very simple sort of diagram of the chlorophyll molecule. That's sort of an atomic spectroscopy look. Clearly, chlorophyll is a molecule. There's more than just arrangement of electrons. And so even if we assume, 
for a given arrangement of electrons, maybe like this, where there's some paired electrons. So this is perhaps a molecular orbital diagram for chlorophyll. This would correspond in our last lecture here to a homo lumo gap, the energy gap between the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. For this arrangement of electrons, in this electronic ground state, this is clearly a singlet ground state. For that given organization, there's not only one energy level, like I've drawn back here for the ground state and the excited states, because it's not just an atom, it's a molecule. And in addition to moving its electrons around, a molecule can have different types of energy. And we talked about this briefly in the last lecture. There's different vibrational energy levels. And so these are the V equals zero, V equals one, all the way up, vibrational energy levels. And of course, there's rotational levels for each vibrational level within each electronic state. So here for this one electronic state that is the ground state, there's a bunch of vibrations. And for each vibration, there's a bunch of rotations. Right? And we label these J equals 0, J equals 1, etc., all the way up. And some of the J rotational levels from this ground vibrational state actually are higher in energy than the j equals zero level of this excited vibrational state. Okay, but I'm not going to draw these extra j levels here because it gets quite convoluted. Okay, so it's much more complicated now, right? We have a bunch of different energy states that are all these quantum states. But that's just for this single ground singlet state. Back here we said, well, there's two excited states, excited state one and excited state two. So let's think about those two states. Let's think about what we could do to excite the electrons here. Ignore for now the vibrations and rotations. And if we're going to excite these electrons, the thing that makes the most sense is to move one of these electrons to the first unoccupied state. Okay, so this singlet state we can excite, but we can really excite it two ways. Okay, we could excite it to this excited state. which is also going to be a singlet. And I can think about that here. Let's not make this too uh, congested here. But I can think about this excited singlet state by taking this one electron and moving it up here, right, without changing the spin. And so that could become... The bottom electrons are still where they were. And now I've moved that one electron up. It still is a spin down. The spin equals zero, it's a singlet state. But that's one possible excited state of the electrons. Okay, the other option is I take this electron and move it up to that same state, but this time I flip the spin. And so now this is a triplet state. And we know from Hund's rules that you maximize spin multiplicity. So this is actually gonna be lower in energy than the singlet state. It might be less favorable because you're having to flip a spin of an electron, but it's one of the possibilities. So from this, ground singlet state, if you're moving one of the electrons in the HOMO to a LUMO in a molecule, you have two choices here. We can go to a singlet state where the spins are still 
offsetting, or a triplet state where the spins now are summing together to give a total spin of one, one half for each unpaired electron, and two s plus one means it's a triplet state. But this triplet state is going to be lower in energy, Then my excited singlet state. Okay, so these are the two states, as black lines we're drawing them now, that we drew as these excited states one and excited state two over here. Of course, within each of these, we can still realize that there's going to be a vibrational progression once the electrons are organized according to this excited singlet state. And there's going to be a vibrational progression for the electron or for the nuclei vibrating a certain way based on the electrons now in this triplet configuration. And of course, within each one of these vibrations, there's a series of rotational energies of the nuclei of the molecule of a whole, as a whole within these vibrational energy levels that are part of these different excited states or different organizations of electrons. Okay, so now we get some appreciation for how complicated nature is, right? For how many different quantum states there are in just a molecule like chlorophyll. It gives us some appreciation for, by comparison, how simple an atom would be where you don't have rotations and vibrations. Okay, so this is building towards, and we can draw the rest of these J terms here. This is starting to look like what's known as a Jablonski diagram, where you're showing all the states and you're going to start drawing arrows demonstrating the way that a photon can cause an absorption or there can be a relaxation. Up till now, we really only considered electronic transitions from like photon absorption and emission without a bunch of vibrational and rotational states in the way. Okay, now that we have all this complicated quantum structure, what we're next going to talk about is, well, what are the possible transitions that can now take place? Okay, sure there's just straight up absorption, right? If I'm in this ground rotational state, of this ground vibrational state, of this ground electronic state, maybe I'm promoted up here, to this excited rotational state of this excited vibrational state of this excited electronic state. That's a photon absorption. It's not like we typically draw it just from ground electronic to excited electronic without really considering vibrations and rotations. Oftentimes we're going to wind up in some excited vibrational and rotational state with that photon absorption. So there's a lot of different possibilities here, not just absorption, but of course you can have relaxation back down, known as emission. But now you can also start to have horizontal motion on this diagram. And a horizontal motion on this diagram means these different vibrational and rotational states of other electronic states can start to transition back and forth. Moreover, there can be relaxation within a given electronic state from vibrations and rotations to other vibrations and rotations. Okay, so while we typically think about absorption and emission between electronic states, there can be vibrational relaxation, rotational relaxation, there can be these horizontal movements in these diagrams. And within a molecule, I can transfer energy then from vibration into rotation into electronic energies. Or the molecule, maybe chlorophyll, is excited and then bumps into a molecule next to it. Or maybe this is the gas phase and this molecule bumps into the wall and loses some energy. Okay, so all of these different transitions are going to be broadly defined as radiative or non-radiative. We'll build out the terminology for each of these types of transitions in the next lecture and talk about the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence 
internal conversion, inner system crossing, vibrational relaxation, all of these things that are depicted here as we fill out a Jablonski diagram and understand what that means for relaying information about photochemistry and the world around us. So that'll do it for this lecture. Next time we'll build the Jablonski diagram out even more and talk about all these different processes and what types of environments those processes are likely to take place in. That'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.